In the last HDR video episode, I explained the very basics about HDR. And today I will give you an overview what's important to know if it comes to color grading in HDR and choosing the right monitor. In general, as always, in color grading, the two fundamental things are the image pipeline and the general workflow, which is oft mixed together, therefore sometimes a bit confusing. In general, as first, you should build up your consistent image pipeline. That's the base. So let's start with the image pipeline. The image pipeline means a technical signal pipeline. The image pipeline starts on set or better in camera. In general, you can color grade almost any footage, which is at least 10 bit and UHD, but you should know that you should use the best image quality you can get out of your camera. So. RAW is always the best choice, if available. If not, you should consider at least a 422 format. The next thing to consider is the frame rate. If you want to shoot 50 or 60 or even more FPS, be aware of the depending crop and resolution, which is available in context with such a frame rate. Again, at least UHDE. UHD <laughs> better is 4K because, and that's very important too, HDR is not only about higher contrast and more luminance, HDR is about better pixel. I explained this in the part one video of this HDR series. I put a link in the upper right corner. The next step to consider in your image pipeline is a hardware. And here in particular, the monitor. The right monitor is a key for a really good HDR color grading. If you only want to edit and cut your images for HDR, you don't need an HDR monitor. But for color grading, you should consider the following things. What is my main working color space, if I have one? Is this the most underrated in the color grading in HDR? And second, what's your budget? And third, what ports do you need? Especially important if you want to connect your camera directly on such a monitor for reviews. Because if your camera has only SDI output for 4K or UHD, your monitor should have SDI inputs too. Otherwise, you may run into problems. Because if your monitor only has HDMI inputs, for example, you should know that HDR10 is only available in HDMI 2.A, for example. So be careful and think about such things twice before you invest in a monitor. And this is very important to understand too in context for OLED TVs. In general, P3 D65 is a quasi standard for nowadays if it comes to color grading in HDR. Rec 2020, on the other hand, is for future screens. That's really important to understand. If you have to deliver in Rec 2020, please don't use BT2020 as your working color space. Use P3 D65 or a BT2020 limited to P3 space. That's one of the most misunderstanding out there, even from people from people who should know that. Okay, so finally here you can see the image pipeline. And as you can see, it's quite simple. The blue boxes represent the software part on the pipeline and I put it in the color pipeline for a better understanding in context just to show you the connection. In the HDR distribution block, you will recognize that I only talk about video sequences because I will not discuss static deliver formats in this series because I think the most of you are mainly interested in video sequence formats. And as you can see, the tone mapping is an essential part of the pipeline. And in this context, it's important to know your color spaces and HDR standards, which you want to use. I know many people ask me what monitor I recommend to use. And that's really one of the biggest questions in context with the image pipeline if it comes to HDR color grading. So in general, you should use an HDR mastering monitor, which can represent at least 1000 nits and can be hardware calibrated because such a monitor can handle PQ and P3 D65 in 10 bit correctly. Furthermore, such a monitor can handle a sampling of RGB 4x4x4, but such a monitor is really very expensive. I use my ISO CG3145 for almost everything. This is this guy here. This monitor is really 
awesome and costs about $15,000. And I know there's way too much for the most guys out there. There are others out there, like some models from Flanders, Canon and Sony. I don't want to dive into all these models deeper, but I can give you a guideline what a good monitor for color grading and HDR should can do. But please, these are general specifications and this overview will help you for a better orientation. You can understand it like a rough guideline. If you can't find your dream monitor, maybe too expensive or whatever this reason is, let me show you some alternatives. In general, a true HDR mastering monitor costs up to $60,000, but <laughs> the market is changing at the moment dramatically. For example, you should have a look at the new ASUS PA32UCG Pro Art display. This monitor is really amazing, but one of the biggest downsides of this monitor is a lack of color accuracy. But it can handle Dolby Vision up to 1600 nits. In my opinion, a good monitor, but as far as I could see, it has a slight magenta cast in the midst too. And in comparison to a true HDR reference monitor, it's a downside, but this Asus costs only around $2,000 and that's a real big deal. You should know that this monitor can only handle DCP3, DCI-P3, and that's a different color space than the P3 D65. That's not a huge downside, but you should keep this in mind. Your working color space should always match your display references. P3 D65, for example, and the color space of the monitor has to be the same. Otherwise, you are going to work blind and your results could look horrible. Another candidate could be the ASUS PA32UCX, which can handle up to 2000 nits. Both are great monitors, both hardware calibratable, but not true HDR mastering monitors. But please, what you should really keep in mind is that such a consumer display have a lot of limitations, like potential color volumetric issues or lots of auto processing. They are not true HDR reference monitors. And finally, what you really need for color grading in HDR is accurate tone mapping. And here, the most consumer displays have their downsides. But if you are satisfied with around 80 or 85% of color accuracy, such a monitor can be the right for you. Another thing you should have you should be aware of is that if you have HDMI as your connectivity, you have to use HDMI 2A for the most HDR standards. So first check if your computer puts a true HDR signal and if you are be able to use HDMI 2A because otherwise you could run into issues in your image pipeline. Okay, another alternate way is to use an OLED TV for color grading, in my opinion, the better choice. You are, but such uh, OLED TVs are not always hardware calibratable, so the color accuracy can differ. If you want to use an OLED for HDR mastering, I highly recommend using P3 D65 as your working color space. That's the best choice in such pipelines. Don't use BT2020 with an OLED only as BT2020 limited space, limited to P3 D65. I see this mistake all the time. You may run into problems if you are not safe in color accuracy. One of the best at the market at the moment are the Panasonic GZW models and the LG C8 and LG C9. These are really amazing TVs and Panasonic gives you additionally a filmmaker mode which allows you to disable the image enhancement algorithms like color and contrast with just one button. And this model has a very high color accuracy. But again, it's not a true HDR mastering display. So be careful. A pro colorist will achieve great results with such a screen. But you should know that the mastering monitor gives you the full control about all image aspects. Many, many OLED TVs not. I love the quality of this new Panasonic series and the LG C8 and C9 models. The most pro colorists use such OLED TVs nowadays as a second reference screen and some as their master display too. By the way, the LG C9 and LG C8 are recommended for HDMI tunneling for Dolby Vision. At the moment, LG and Panasonic have the best models for HDR color grading on the market. 
If it comes to OLEDs, you should know that the color accuracy is very important and the screen uniformity too, because that's often a problem with OLED consumer TVs. The models I mentioned are really very accurate. So be sure to check this out if you are looking for another model. And by the way, the new LG CX models are really great too if it comes to accuracy. Furthermore, the LG CX is the most affordable OLED TV at the moment and it's available in 50, 50, 55 and 48 inch, which is really fantastic. I would consider between the mentioned ASUS models, for example, and an OLED. I would choose the LG C8 or C9 because this display offers me much control and they are more affordable too in comparison to my ISO CG3145 for example, but that's my opinion. And please, this is just an help and orientation for you. And the ASUS, the backlight technology is great, but in accuracy and the screen uniformity and OLED is better. It's a better choice. In general, ISO has the best monitors, but very expensive. So as first, I would choose an ASO because they are the best on the market. And my second choice would be an LG CX or LG C9. Additionally, you should know that you should control the gamma and the gamut on the OLED. Uh, the mentioned models can do that. And if available, you should choose PQ instead of gamma too. And that's very important if it comes to HDR color grading because in HDR, the AOTF is PQ. I discussed this topic in the first episode of this little HDR series here. So important beneath NIT values is a color accuracy. What color spaces can represent? And is the display hardware calibratable? What connection ports are available? And the resolution. Because HDR is at least UHD, much better is 4K. These are the main characteristic characteristics you should be aware of. And if you are using a MacBook Pro for your grading with Thunderbolt 2 or 3, you should know that you need a playback solution. For example, the new Blackmagic Ultra Studio 4K Mini, because otherwise you can run into issues with your signal. And Aja has a desktop model too. I guess it's called Aja IO. 4K plus, but it's more expensive than the Blackmagic Ultra Studio 4K. I put the link into for, for both solutions uh, in the description. And finally, let me quickly explain you why you should use at least 1000 nits as your mastering luminance if you want to deliver Dolby Vision, for example. You are working with dynamic metadata and in this case, the luminance values will be mapped to lower luminance values dynamically dynamically on your display or on the fly if you want so. So if you watch a 1000 nits master Dolby Vision on a 600 nits display, for example, the peak values of 1000 nits will be matched correctly to this 600 nits peak level of the display. And this also applies to the black values too. To get a better understanding of what we are talking about in terms of differences in nits, on this graphic, you can see some displays and NIT values in comparison. And finally, now you should understand that you should use or consider first how to build up your image pipeline and what kind of display you should use. And just to make it clear, I'm not paid in any terms for my hardware or software recommendations. It's just my own experience and my own opinion. And no, I'm not paid or sponsored by ASO. I bought my ASO monitor with my own money. Furthermore, I use the LG C8 very often too. And I love this display, but I paid it with my own money too. Okay, we are done. For sure, I could dive in deeper in some parts, but I want to keep it short as possible. And so stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe. As always, thanks for watching and listening to. You all a great time. Bye.